Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, hi all, uh, welcome to the uh, oh. post-lunch session. Yesterday you heard Kun uh, talk about software, his efforts, seven-year path towards <laughs> the software-defined radio uh, platform. Now you'll see uh, he's done a lot of work on MIMO in the past few years, and much of it ha actually has been done on Sora. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, he'll, he, that's what he's going to talk about now. So let's okay. hear what he has to say. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending my uh, talk. So in this afternoon, I'm going to talk about two slightly related things. One is a MIMO, and another is a dynamic spectrum access, the two port. And uh, as uh, Krishna has said, so uh, basically talk about from the system point of view, that is how we can build the system to implement uh, MIMO, basically how to make the MIMO more scalable, and also how we can enable this dynamic spectrum access as a first uh, pretty much of the wireless system. Okay, so, <coughs> oops. No, no. So actually, the motivation of this uh, line of research is simple, is that we design more wireless capacity, right? So this is because of now the wireless network it became the primary network for access. So we have a whole bunch of these uh, smart devices, smartphone, tablet, and this auto book, which use the wireless as the only access to the internet. So that's why we need more uh, wireless bandwidth. And also, the, because, because this mobile device became more powerful, so they can enable a lot of this data incentive applications. Now you're doing the video conferencing, now you do the, even the telepresence, that consume, needed to communicate a lot of data. So currently, we have talking about how the, the data pattern that's most likely from the internet to your device. But now with this, all these smart devices, so the paragraph needs to be the shift. So not only the download traffic become very increasing, still increasing, but also the uplink uh, traffic. So we need to consider about how we do that. Not only to improve the downlink traffic, also the uplink traffic. So it had been predicted. Some prediction have made that. So actually we have going to carry more data traffic over wireless instead of this wide link. So that makes, let's say, just motivate, we need more wireless capacity. So, yeah, so how can get more wireless capacity? Firstly, we have to use the spectrum reuse. So basically, we, we, we say that because the one is just a propagating in certain range. So if we can reduce the range and put more X points, so you Eventually, you can get more close to the access point, and you can use a, uh, uh, you can get more capacity, right? So it's like, I think, uh, have been a long research along this line. Like, reduce, say, from, from 3G point of view, it re just reduce their cell size. From this uh, macro cell to micro cell to femto cell. But I already consider about the uh, Wi-Fi is, uh, is already very small, okay? So probably we have uh, uh, reached the point that uh, the seal should not be that very small because if, it, if, it, if the seal is becoming really small, then the handle of things, mobility has become more complex, how to manage the network. But anyway, this is one way to do that. Another way is we get more spectrum, okay? Because we know that from the communication theory that if there's more, you have more frequency to transmit, you really get more capacity. But we know that the spectrum is basically a shared resource, so it's a scarce and it has a limit. Okay, so there's a lot of research to can use of better. I um, mean, so normally currently the frequency we use for communication is usually below the six gigahertz. Okay, but there's a research line to do communication over very high uh, frequency, like uh, 60 gigahertz. 
Uh, but 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 that sure this is a way to do that. But the the, the other way which uh, we're going to cover in this talk is how we can use existing spectrum more efficiently. Okay. Basically, there are two ways. The first is like, how can we uh, squeeze more bit on every hertz of frequency currently we can use. Okay. So this basically regarding to the multi input multi output of MIMO things. And the second thing is which reduce the spectrum, uh, this waste of the spectrum. So how, how can we more efficiently uh, allocate this spectrum for different wireless technology or wireless devices? So this is uh, regarding to the dynamic spectrum access. So in this impact, these two techniques are related to each other. So we know that the, the MIMO, right? So basically, MIMO can be modeled in this way. So uh, we have a stream of data. Then we strip the data bits to different antennas, okay, and transmit simultaneously on this a uh, different this multiple output uh, antennas, and uh, this waveform going to mash up in the uh, wireless channel, and it received as the receiving antennas, and this receiving antennas doing a joint signal processing to demultiplex all these uh, this uh, transmission signals. So we get these uh, different spatial streams. Okay. Then with di each different uh, each uh, spatial streams, we're going to decode, de uh, quantize them, demap them, and decoding them. So we get the information bits uh, that they transmit. So make it more mathematically is that we model the channel as a metric. So it's a n by n uh, metric. So each element of the metric corresponding to a propagation path over the wireless channel from one transmit antenna to a receiving antenna. Okay. Now with this modeling, the receiving signal is can be represented by the channel uh, matrix multiplied by the transmitting signals. And of course, price a random uh, noise here. Then we got these uh, trans, uh, this, uh, equations. So the MIMO decoding is basically to solve these equations. Okay. So it, it is very simple if H is square and invertible. So if it can invertible, we, we can compute the H uh, that's inverse of the H and the plus uh, and the multiple that to the received signals. So then we got X. And we got the X, and we basically we do the all the decoding part, and we get this information bits. Uh, in general, if the transmission antenna and the receiving antenna is not equal, then the edge is not uh, square. Okay, but we can also we still can do the solve this equation by uh, get this pseudo inverse of the edge. Now basically, we can um, to compute this this one, um, and then we got X. Okay, so this basically called zero forcing. Right? So the idea of why it's called zero forcing because it, the decoding part can be considered about just uh, zeroing out all the self interference. Then you get the desired signal stream uh, from the signals. But we can do better if we know the loss level. Okay, so uh, you know, previously we have this. This doesn't work. Previously we we have this noise. Uh, this noise considered, but in this decoding process, we do not consider this uh, noise. But if we know the noise level, actually we can do it better. They handle this uh, noise. So we, we change the uh, decoder from this one to this one. And this is called uh, MMSE. So it's a better uh, decoding mechanism if we have considered the noise level. So this is basically the MIMO operations. But the MIMO operations require these multiple antennas and both sender and the receiver. Okay. So it's not usual case that as a mobile device you can have many, many uh, receiving antennas, right? Because it's a size consideration, there's a power consideration, and uh, so usually we, we consider that the access point you can have many antennas because it's more powerful, it can have the power supply. But the mobile Stations, these mobile devices only have very few, like one or two uh, antennas. Okay. 
So with that, how we can extend the MIMO operation to the, the, the situation when all these mobile devices have only a few antennas? Okay. So this is an idea that comes from the, uh, come the idea of the multi-user MIMO. So the idea of multi-user MIMO is that we, we treat all the collection of different small devices as a, um, a, as a big, uh, it's virtually a, a station that have many antennas, okay? So then we have the uplink operation and the downlink operation. So let's consider the uplink operation. So uplink operation is that basically all these mobile devices transmit the signals to the access point, okay? So as long as we figure out a way to synchronize that, we can do that by, by sending a broadcast message on the channel. So let this mobile device transmit simultaneously then the access point basically can use the same MIMO operations, uh, MIMO decoding procedures to decode this message. Okay, then you get the information from each of the uh, mobile device. Okay, so it's basically the same, unless we get got some uh, synchronization there. But the downlink is very different. Okay, because now we, as we remember that the, when you do the MIMO decoding, we need this joint processing. That means you need all information from each and receiving antenna and to cancel uh, self-interference. But in this downlink, since, uh, uh, downlink case, this mobile device are just an individual device. It do not, cannot communicate to each other okay, efficiently. So basically, you cannot do the joint single processing. Okay. But we can have a clever way to do this. It's basically, we can move this joint single processing from receiver to the sender. Okay, so this process is called pre-coding. Assuming that the access point know the channel state information to the oldest uh, mobile states. Okay, then the sender can compute a precoder. It's basically another metric called P. The P equal to this. Uh, so this uh, this H is basically the channel state. And P equal to this one, okay? It's very like this pseudo inverse of the channel. And instead of transmit X, it transmit PX, okay? So you can simply verify that after the channel, the H and P just cancel each other, okay? Then each receiving, each mobile station basically get the spatial uh, streams that it designed. So they do not have the self-interference. The interference is canceled when it transmits the signals. Okay, so this is the, basically the MIMO and the multi-user MIMO operations in theory. So, so this is very promising uh, because in theory, it can linearly increase the channel capacity by deploying more antennas than you get basically unlimited uh, capacity, right? But the question we're going to ask, can we, what kind of system design can we make to really make a large scalable MIMO system? Okay, what is the uh, issue we need to consider in our system design that's really not this wireless capacity scale with more antennas deployed in our access point? So we will talk about large scale. So how large is large, right? So we need to have set some goal because in system design, we always have a goal there and see if we can achieve this, okay? So the goal we set, of course, this is the ultimate goal we set, is we want to realize a vision that we can deliver a gigabit wireless link to every mobile users, okay? So why we pick a gigabit? Because now we have the gigabit uh, Ethernet, right? So we want to, if we say we shift all the traffic from the what network to the wireless network, we need to provide at least a comparable link speed to the different users. So that's why we pick up the gigabit wireless. So this is a state of art. Uh, so if one, we want to do the gigabit wireless, how many antenna and bandwidth? So we have this different bandwidth and different antenna. Say we just uh, compute how much capacity we can get in, in, in theory, uh, in optimal case. And we say 
this basically what defined in a to dot e n a. Okay, so it's up to four, um, four by four MIMO, and can deliver like six hundred megabit per second at the maximum rate. And this part is a to dot eleven eight C. So it said, uh, we can support at eight, of up to eight. Okay, so and uh, up to one hundred and sixty megahertz uh, bandwidth. So now we change. So in order we're going to do that, we say this part is the large scale MIMO system we target that. So we can support 100 antennas and of course 1. Uh, 160 megahertz uh, bandwidth. Yeah, please. This one? Yes. Uh, the downlink will be specific to each client, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you segregate that? Like you, you are uh, you are virtualizing the entire clients in one conglomeration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, yeah. So basically, the so, so the downlink is the 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 exponent can select which user to transmit. Okay. Then it gets the packet for each users. Then it do the precoding processes and transmit the signals simultaneously. On each of these antennas, the the access point has. Okay, then this signal is just a mesh up, and each receiver because it's a it's a, it's a properly precoded, then each receiving each mobile user basically get just get the signal is targeted at it. Then it just pass through the normal decoding as if there's one to one uh, communication. Okay. That the key is pre-coding because they cancel the channel, cancel the channel effects before it transmit the signals. Okay. No. Yeah. This is a, the assumption here is that X points knows the channel to each mobile device. Okay. So th this is a. Assumptions, and then in later we could tell you how we get this channel state information, okay, in an effective way. So this is basically why I can do better because because so in my mode, you do not the sender may not lead the channel state, okay, because the receiver knows you can measure the channel and get all the information. But if you're doing much user my mode, you want to do the pre-coding process, you lead the sender has this channel state information. So NASA say it's a constraint, then uh, of course you get more information, you can do better. Okay. okay, and more more questions on that? Okay. Um, yeah, so so th this is a vision to have this large number of antennas and uh, so we can give uh, particularly, if we consider about, if we support only uh, 20 concurrent users, consider the access point that covers a certain area. So now, in average, probably only a few tens of mobile users there. So if we can co cover this small area, then we see probably we can do that uh, in different, because of the spatial use. Okay. So this is what I'm trying to pick, is that if we support this uh, 20 concurrent users in this bandwidth, at least we need 40 antennas. Okay, something here, 40 antennas. Okay, so they say we set up a goal. We're trying to support uh, 40 antennas. Um, this is our ultimate goal. So we, we still improve, improving to achieve that goal. Oh, yeah. So what's the challenge? Basically, I think these are the challenges. Are the, the three of challenges. The first challenge is that. Actually, I have just mentioned. So, in order to do the precoding, it requires the standard get the channel state information. This is not usually you can get because the channel is varying, right? So, it's it, it, it's changed all the time, right? So, how can you get this information? It's really challenge. So. And the second thing is that if we really want to do a large scale MIMO system, then they do the whole joint processing consume a lot of computation. How we can build a access point actually can do the re this single processing in real time. Okay. 
Finally, it's about the neck. And we'll continue it. When you do the MIMO transmissions, pick up different users actually significantly affect your scalability. If you pick up the wrong person, or wrong, wrong mobile users, and group that in a MIMO transmission, sometimes they may not increase your capacity. Okay. Now we say that picking up this, this user selection is really a very hard problem, and we need some way to handle this. Oh, you, you can still synchronize that. You can do it, yeah, you can do it, synchronize the path. Sure, yeah. So the, the, the question is that if the uplink is completely asynchronous, then the MIMO doesn't improve a lot, yes. But the thing is that when, uh, if this traffic is light, then of course you don't need the MIMO because the, your, your wireless capacity is sufficient to support these uh, transmissions, okay. But the, when the things get congested, that means you, you should have some mobile users have packets backlogged at the same time. Okay. Otherwise, you won't get congested, right? So when it gets congested, then you have some users get their backlog packet at the same time. Now you can use in the MIMO, the multi-user MIMO, to transmit simultaneously to to get more bandwidth, or more capacity. Okay. Okay. So how we can get this? As channel state, um, I mean, it's basically get the channel state information from the sender. We call that a chan, uh, CSI. CSI basically channel state information acquisition problem. Okay. So, because they you usually cannot get the CSI from the sender, so the conventional way basically have this feedback loop. Okay. So idea is simple. So to so the sender the actor point basically transmit a orthogonal signal on each of these antenna uh, in very close time. Okay. You, treat, you can treat that at the same time. And uh, to the receivers. And for each orthogonal tra trading symbol, it, all these receivers are going to measure the channel state. Okay. And they get this channel state and pack it in some form of packet and get the feedback to the access point. Okay. In this way, we can get this. But the problem is that actually this is not scale. Um, because you, we need to measure this channel state on every frame. And so the, 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 from the Mac layer, we have a three stage. We got the measure stage, feedback stage, and the frame. Uh, the, the frame. frame is basically you transmit the data frame. Okay, you do the precoding and the transmit the frame. Okay. Um, so CSR measurement. It's linear with the number of antennas you want to measure. Okay, so how many transmission antennas you need to measure that? So consider in our case we have 40 antennas. Okay, then each we transmit eight milliseconds. So th this basically with the bandwidth in in falling total the bandwidth is 20 megahertz by the default. Okay, so if it's a larger, if a wider band we need a longer training symbols. Okay, so this is based on 20. So then we have this 300 uh, uh, millisecond time to measure the channel. Okay. The feedback actually takes a lot of time. Okay. This is still linear with the number of antennas. You need a transmission packet for every antenna to tr get this uh, CSR packet. Uh, uh, so uh, actually, you can every load can transmit a packet for all the CSR states. It's measured for each. Uh, transmission antenna. Okay. So why is it taking longer for the wider bandwidth? You're just doubling the number of subcarriers, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Energy has come down, or? Um, if you have a wide band, it means you transmit more energy because the unit energy on each uh, frequency should be keep a constant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah. Is that the reason why it's doubled? Oh uh, no, it's because. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> oh <Is there laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But it doesn't change so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Yeah, 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 right. <coughs> yeah, right. So this number is, is not dependent on the bandwidth, yeah. Yeah. So even, even longer bandwidth, you have a more sampling rates, then you keep the symbol uh, constant. <coughs> Sorry. So, but, but the packing the packets, 
gets more overhead. You need to program both. You need to do the coding and, and so on and so forth. And you need to consider about the rate. So actually, this number is basically 1.4 millihertz because we just uh, just why we pick this is basically using the noise rate, like six mag uh, mag bit per second modulation for the reliability for some reason, and then you just pack all the bits you want to measure the CSR into that. So this is a a, a, a long packet, and it's some total is really long, so like 56 milliseconds, right? But consider about data transmission, consider about the normal packet size, okay? So it only take a few milliseconds to transmit, okay? So if you consider in this way, actually you, you get the channel measurement, you spend more time than transmitters really use for data, okay? Please. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, right, right. So, yeah. I just, I just, this is just a back value. So let's see how we can improve that. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's see how we. So, yes, you're right. So, we can accommodate by uh, one way is just doing the frame aggregation. Let's see. I do a lot of frames in one compilation. But actually, we consider this you need really a lot of frames to do this, right? And, uh, so using large frames have other concerns like to increase the delay and also increase the possibility of being interfered and the packet loss, right? Also, if they're moving, right, the CSI would have changed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Although the coherence time, yes. So first thing we can see, in previously we see that one of the majority over high is the feedback, okay? So we're trying to get rid of that. So the idea is that then we consider we're using the channel reciprocity. Okay, now we can remove this feedback. Hey, by the reciprocity is like you can imagine a wide channel. Okay, it's basically the per propagation path of this um, radio wave. Okay, then consider about sender when this transmitter signal goes through this path, certain path, and then we get a receiver. And on the reverse path is basically the receiver send the signal, it should follow the same path, okay? So in this sense, the forward channel should equal to the, uh, to the reverse channel. So that is how the channel reciprocity states, okay? Yeah. But the truth is that the media, this tracing part, I mean, this propagation path, is only part of the, trans only the part of the channel that you measured as the baseband, okay? Basically, when you transmit, you should go through this transmission chain, this particular hardware. Then you go to some wireless me uh, media, this is basically the media, and receive that receiver chain, okay? So you go these points. Now we know that the channel is actually, so the effect the channel of this transmission basically this factor multiplied by this factor and this factor, okay? But the re reverse is just passing through different chains, different transmitter chain and different receiver chain, okay? So it's like, they say we have a different channel coefficient. The, re the, ch the, the, the channel receptor only holds at this part, considered by the propagation. So if we, if we consider this model, actually we can solve that, we got these equations, like the downlink path is a, just a factor of the uplink path. Um, then th we rewrite this factor as the GXR. The good news is that this GXR is basically depend only on the hardware, okay? It does not change over the time. So we can do a calibration when, when you first register the access point, you do the one calibration, then you can use that. As long as you do not, you do not restart the radio, you keep the, the, the radio hardware running. Okay. So that means uh, actually channel reciprocity, reciprocity after carefully treatment, it can be used in practice. Okay. The second thing is how we can reduce this per packet CSM measurement. So the, actually, the 
idea is very simple. We have a KL has mentioned about the channel coheres time. Okay, that means the wise channel depends on mobility. They should keep in constant in certain time period. Okay, so here is a, is a, it's a, one of the measurements we have done in in our building. Is that if you stay stay still, okay, you just don't move, the coherence time can be very very large, like two hundred milliseconds. You do slight move, it will reduce to like 40. If you do relatively fast move, one meter per second, one meter per second means you are just normal walking, then it's reduced to 40. If you really run something like not not a fast run, but uh, walking very fast, then you still have the 10 uh, tens of milliseconds coherence time. So, so we do not need to measure the chain, uh, me measure the, uh, the CSI. In, so only get only only need one CSI measurement during the coherence time. That's enough, right? So we do not do, need to do the per packet. But but wait a second. <laughs> so what do you mean, really mean? Okay, channel keep states, keep constants, right? What does it really mean, right? Yes, actually, if you measure the channel from the baseband, the channel continuously change. Never ever can find the two channel measurement are just a constant. Okay. The reason because as I mentioned, the the effective channel is not, not only determined by this propagation part, but also your hardware part. Okay. Now you have the transmission chain and the receiving chain, they have different frequency offset. So this is frequency offset will keep on changing your measured channel in a way that it makes this channel, so this H0 means this, uh, you know, how to say, some, uh, some true channel that reflects the propagation property of the wireless channel. But the, this frequency offset of this hardware chain actually keep on this rotation with a certain speed. Okay. This part vary over time. Okay, so actually the channel never keep constant in practice. Okay, the different hardware and the hardware difference make it running keep. So now the problem is that when you do the channel measure, we need to measure that at the same time. Okay, but different users may have different, uh, so may have different uh, uh, coherence time. Okay, you need to update at a different time. And also, you may pick up different users in, a tr in, in one transmission. So you pick up this user. So that means how you can combine, combine the, the measurement, the channel measurement, from a different time instance to form a precoder is really the key. If you cannot do that, that means it's all reduced to really to the measure because you pick up a different user, you need to measure channel, right? Because this Compilation of users is unique uh, in, in, in your transmission. Okay. So we, we need to put more study on how this CSI measurement, how this, how this CSI uh, difference over the time impact our precoder design. <coughs> so this is basically uh, just using very simple two by two. Uh, much use a MIMO case. Okay, so the X point have two transmission antenna, and the station each station have one antenna, so it's two uh, two stations. Now, when the station measure, so we consider about the reciprocity. Okay, so when the station one measure the channel, basically the station one transmit the transmi uh, training symbol, and the AP X point measure the channel. Right, so they got this knot. So this measure as a uh, as a T1 time time point, and the T2, the AP gets this measure at the T2 point. Okay. So actually, it's different from if you measure at the the channel. It looks different if you measure the channel exactly before you transmit the packet to T uh, to station one and station two. But what is the impact? I can do some math. Is that we can decouple that into a these two parts. Okay. 
This part is basically, you do not have this routing phase. That means this just determined by the media propagation structure. Okay. This part is determined by the time you measure and the frequent offset between the transmitter and the receiver. This is hardware determined, uh, dependent. So actually, fortunately, this one does not matter when we do the precoding because it can be correct at the receiver. Okay, so anyone can explain this, right? <laughs> okay, why this part? This is different from what the real channel measured, but this is uh, doesn't match if when we do the precoder. Okay. So actually, we can expand that using a this following uh, expand that in the following equations. So we derive that. So the precoder basically we just using the edge. So the edge is not the true edge, but the one we have uh, just uh, artificially put together. Like this one, okay. So they have this this part. We we term that the lambda. Okay. This part we term as zero. Okay. So the precoder still is the reverse of H. Then it can translate into the S zero, uh, the inverse of H zero, and the inverse of this uh, uh, diagonal uh, metric. Okay. Then we consider about the when you do the precoding. And this precoded signal goes through the channel. Actually, this part canceled out. Okay, so the channel propagation uh, interference just canceled the other. Now we left two diagonal uh, metric. So this is doesn't matter too much because we still attach the training symbols at each uh, packet, the spatial uh, spatial streams. Then this can be measured at the receiver and correct by the receiver. It's basically a phase rotation of the signals. So now, you still do that. Uh, just to treat this artificial combined channel as a real channel, then you can still do the precoding. Okay. So this is a very nice property. Okay. That would imply the exponent can track the CSR of each mobile station independently. Okay, so the access point basically maintain a database. In this database, it just uh, get each entry, just a record the CSI for each mobile station. Okay, it has uh, a uh, channel value, a timestamp at which it's measured, and a track coherence time to that user. Okay, then when you do the transmission, just check out this database. Say if this user this, this compilation of this user have the valid uh, coherence, time, uh, coherence uh, entry, it just put it together and form a precoder, and compute a precoder for that. And if we found that, if the exponent found some station channel just, off, just become, uh, um, uh, become out of date, it's just uh, instruct send a measurement request to the user and that user send out another training symbol to update this entry. So this makes this channel tracking and uh, uh, channel state tracking incremental. Okay, so that's a very nice property if you want to design a scalable system. Okay. Okay, so I need to be a little quick. <laughs> okay, so the second thing I'm calling about is scalable uh, joiners. Um, signal processing. So, so what, uh, why we need to consider about it? Because we can do some very quick back of analog calculation on how much computation we need to do a processing uh, on X point. So, so you do that, still an example like this gigabit link per user. Actually, we compute that from the data path, you need a few hundred gigabit per second to get all these digital samples to the access point from the access points, uh, from the uh, antennas. And then when you do computation, the channel inverse and the spatial demultiplexing and channel decoding 
It takes a lot of computation power to do that. Okay. So it sums up. It means it requires 7.2 tera operation per second. That's a lot of computation. I can, I can hardly imagine you can build a single chip that do that. Okay. So that means a centralized, if you consider the centralized, some centralized entity doing this, it's basically impossible. You cannot, it, it may be possible, but, but very, very difficult to build a single chip to do that. So the scale, the, you see that the um, only thing we can do make it scale is that we can parallelize this joint single processing. If we can parallelize, that means we instead of building a huge chip to do that, we can have uh, many small processing unit. Each of them is only doing a tiny part of the processing, and then group it together, connect all the results together, and we'll get the, all the uh, uh, data, uh, all the streams we want. Okay, so actually, the first thing of that is really easy, right? Because, because the transmission, the, the network transmission, is naturally can be parallelized uh, because you transmit each packet independently. Right? So basically, you can have this a bunch of uh, processing server connected by some e uh, fast Ethernet network, and the antennas basically do the packet detection. Okay, I have a packet, and then I transmit all the packets to one uh, server, like this. Okay, now I got the second packet and send another server. So we can do this as long as we so have enough servers, we can just uh, process all the signals we get. Okay, so that's a that's not a big deal. <clears throat> but the real problem is that it takes a lot of time to process on a single server. So actually, that they can induce a long processing delay. Okay, like if you process a packet, imagine the packet like forty antennas. Easily go to one second to process it, even on current uh, current state of light uh, server, okay, like a sixteen core server. So, but we know that one is protocol uh, protocol requires usually milliseconds feedback, okay. Like O2.11 is really microsecond level, but if you want to do some three uh, G or, or, or some other thing, then that would go into milliseconds, three milliseconds or ten milliseconds. So it's a, a huge difference here. So we need to some further inspection. How can we speed up the packet, the, the, the packet processing? Okay, not only we do the packet paradigm, that's enough. We need to explore the paradigm inside the packet to speed up the per packet processing. So we look at this uh, uh, this, uh, this joint processing. Uh, this is a uh, MIMO processing pipeline. We got this channel inverse, and there's a spatial multiplexing, and the channel decoding. So here, by channel decoding, basically, I include all the demodulation part there, because it's uh, basically not that uh, um, different from channel decoding. So these two parts, basically, are performed on the each subcarrier. Okay. So it's a naturally idea to do the subcarrier parallelism um, based on this two stage. And the channel decoding is performed on each spatial streams. So actually, spatial stream pattern can be used in this stage. Okay. After this observation, actually, we build a system to form, uh, by the way, we, we named that a big station, okay. <coughs> to build this distributed problem. Okay. So we group the servers into three stages. Okay. So each stage also contains a group of Service is perform the same task at this stage, so the trans the signals going to from the front side uh, module, uh, basically the radio front end. Okay, then you then transmit to different uh, uh, server at the stage, and shuffle at the other stage and shuffle the another stage. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Right. So e each each stage contains a group of servers that are doing further doing these uh, data paradigms. So the, the whole operation is like this, OK? So after the ant antenna, they got uh, samples on each subcarrier. We do the FFT here, and they got the samples of each subcarrier. And they partition the signals according to a subcarrier and stand 
the sub the signal to the same subcarrier to the channel inverse uh, servers and the spatial multiplexing servers. Okay, then you do the channel inverse here and then do the spatial uh, demultiplexing here. After this stage, they group the uh, the the symbols according to their spatial uh, streams and shuffle the data again and make each uh, subcarrier according to the a, a, a spatial streams. Okay, then the decoding server working on this spatial uh, this spatial stream. So let's take an example. Um, so if we have a gigabit to twenty users, so in that dimension. So it's uh, 160 macros means that it's, uh, it's totally it has 468 uh, parallel subcarriers. And uh, now, if you use subcarrier paradigms, then each server leads only to handle a minimum of 10 megabit per second data. This is the corresponding to the data rate of a single <coughs> subcarrier. So there's a minimum you can you want you need to get. So this is easy you can process. Actually, current server can process much more data than this. So it can handle uh, several subcarriers. And uh, the spatial stream partition, then each server, decoding server, need to handle 5 gigabit per second. So you still consider previously it's 200 gigabit per second. Now it's only 5 gig per second. So it can really easy to fit current, uh, like, uh, uh, it's net, net, network port and the multi-core architecture. Okay. okay. By, by seeing that when you do the processing at the single server, we still need to consider the parallelism of the server itself. Because now we have imagine the server have multiple cores, you can have a lot of SMB instructions, then you can explore this server um, paradigms. If you can explore that well, then actually we can do the processing very fast. Fortunately, we found that the key algorithms uh, used in MIMO detection, like metric, metric multiplication, inverse, and Viterbi decoding, actually can be quite easily parallelized okay, on different cores. Um, so this I just uh, give you a few examples. Like uh, metric multiplication is really, you can uh, do in a, a divide and a conquer way. Actually, you can, you can rewrite that become a two, the, the multiplication of two sub metric. And each of them can be assigned to different code and to get a result summed up. Then you, 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 you just re make, the, make them uh, speed up the processing. The channel inverse can be, uh, also can be parallelized. Uh, we're using a way called uh, Johnson, Gaussian Jordan method, which one is just used independently doing this uh, uh, elimination of each lines, okay, each rows, then you get, you can assign a different row to different cores and then doing this elimination um, independently. Then finally you can got this result in a, in a parallel manner. Okay, that's quite straightforward. But another, it's not quite straightforward is to parallelize the Viterbi decoder, okay. So it's actually, it's actually why it's difficult because the Viterbi decoding is performed on a sequence of continuous bits, soft bits. Okay, so in this sense, it cannot be parallelized. Okay, so one way we can do that is we just artificially divide the bit streams into blocks and assign into blocks different calls and doing this uh, decoding. But that has a problem because um, each at the boundary of uh, the, the blocks, they do not hold in this convolution properly. So then sub, uh, this, this, this boundary will cause a very high uh, bit error rate. Okay, so that's not good. So the solution is that we're just padding a little bit okay, of these blocks. So we're decoding through this, uh, this gray block. But this data we do not really use, just, just remove that. So we create a little bit overhead on computing, but we get more accurate result uh, of this, uh, this, uh, this blue box. Then how, there's a question of how we can design 
the right block size. Okay, this is basically the between the latency and the overhead. So we have larger blocks, then we have a, a less overhead because this part basically overhead. Okay, uh, but also had a longer delay. So actually, we the goal we want to do is to fully utilize this computational capacity while keep this L as minimal. That means that we have a minimal delay while we keep the whole uh, processing unit busy. So basically, the, the intuition is that, so we get this uh, equation to do this. But the intuition of the equation is that we, we need to partition the block in the way that after one block, the one, one block is being decoded, you can immediately get a new block uh, to schedule a new block on this processor without any gap. Okay. So if without we do not have a gap, then every processor simply keep on busy right, doing decoding. Okay. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. You can derive that yourself. Okay. okay, so there's only, of course, other optimization because one, 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 one communication property is that we have different, over a different state, we need to shuffle the data, right? Shuffle the data. So there's a one problem, very subtle problem, when you do the communication, because all the data are going to transmit to one particular server. There is a possibility that the server buffer going to overrun and they got the packet loss. And if you got the packet loss, then you increase the processing delay, this, uh, because you need to retransmit the packet. So this problem, we call it the incast problem. So you just uh, many senders dump data simultaneously to a receiver, and the receiver simply get lost because it's not enough buffer. <coughs> so, but but this problem we can solve that because we know exactly know the packet traffic pattern because we know how much data you can get. Okay, then we can provision the packet. Uh, I mean, uh, provision the buffer carefully to avoid any packet loss. Okay. Yeah. And uh, also other communication style, uh, they didn't kind of did, uh, move it. Okay, let's see some uh, uh, macro benchmark. Um, first, we let's say uh, this channel inverse. Actually, say that actually we can perform channel inverse very well with current server. Um, for example, if we want to have these forty antennas, actually we can do that with in two hundred milliseconds. Okay, it's pretty fast. And if you have more calls, it can further increase the reduce its processing speed. Okay. So actually we well, found that the channel inverse is not really a bottleneck of the entire system. Okay. And also the spatial multiplexing, actually we can do at uh, two, three, more than three gigabit per second um, with this is four calls. And 40 is close to one gigabit per second. Okay, so spatial multiplexing is still still okay. Okay, now we have decoding still the bottleneck. Okay, with four calls, we can only boost the uh, the the traffic uh, the, the, the throughput to like uh, uh, barely below the 300 megabit per second. So if we want to have the one gig, we need more calls, maybe eight calls, uh, or or even more. We can do this. But anyway, the, the point is that. We can scale the processing speed along with the call at many calls, and we can speed this up. So the, the whole point, we, we have got this data point. Then we can do some hypothesis analyze on how much service we can get if we really want to do a uh, large scale MIMO. Right? So, so this is uh, basically the three configuration we want. It's a media scale, large scale, and ultra scale. So auto scale this reflect to fifty users, each one have the one gigabit second. Large scale twenty users is sixty uh six hundred uh, um, um feet per second per user. So with four calls, actually we can pretty with four core servers we can do that media. Of course it's uh, doesn't um it doesn't need more many, many servers. Okay, only a few servers can do that. Large scale we can manage, but it's still a lot. For the auto large, actually, they're going to be a decent <laughs> to doing this uh, processing. Okay, it's too much. But this is only four core server. Okay. But we can consider that with um, currently we already have 16 cores, and in a few years we have 13, 
uh, 33, uh, 32 cores, then it's going to significantly reduce the number of servers we need. So with uh, still not that small, but this you can handle uh, in a small rules, just a few racks of servers can do that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really a targetable, uh, targetable goal that we can we, 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 we may achieve in a few years. Did you? Yeah, definitely you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a good question. So we we think about that, but haven't uh, explored this. Uh, I'm not sure IPG and actually FPG, um, definitely you can build FPG. So you still need a very large, many, many FPG. Yeah, use, yeah. Use number yeah, number of them. Yeah, sure. So actually, we, we brought up this. Um, this is Sora Mimo Kit. So it's uh, like, uh, so this, uh, this is a picture, it's, it's a 4x4 Sora. MIMO video front end, and we connect that to stream servers as a, a, a front end. Then we have the line dark back to a data center we have in our, in our, uh, in our office. And we have a, a, using a 12 servers to process the signals. And we're very exciting on that, and so we run the, a, the benchmark. First, it's about the processing delay. Because you know, we, we need to shuffle the data a, a, a few times. Right? So, the processing delay is actually like uh, 860 uh, microsecond, okay? Because uh, the, you transfer from the the, the uh, Ethernet and uh, and doing this. <coughs> so the go the, the the reason why we get that load latency because we control the transmission pretty well. So we never never uh, overflow this switch buffer. Because we know the traffic, so we control the, tra uh, the transmission rate very well. So you do not overflow the buffer. You do not have the loss. Uh, yeah, but we still, of course, we still have a loss. Okay, like, uh, this have this heavy too. And uh, if we have a more heavy uh, node, that means we have other traffic going on. That almost we still have this. Y y the mean is still like this number, but we have a, a longer tail, okay, because of the interference of other traffic there. But, um, <clears throat> but I was saying that this still can be improved with the uh, current advantage of networking technology. One pa particular technology we can use is the uh, remote uh, DMA that can replace the TCP IP, which we re can achieve like an order of uh, magnitude to improve in the latency. But, but, but by the way, so this number is pretty good for 3G and, uh, and, uh, and cellular protocols if you can get the data process in one millisecond. So we get the first experiment. We run the first experiment. experiment but we found that the result is actually not encouraging. Right? So no, we increase the antenna, but we, they, they just capped at some point and they never go through. Like, like you know, just a 100 uh, megabit per second, then it never goes through. Then we find that why we did this because in this experiment, we choose the receiving antennas just equal to the transmitter antennas. That means the transmitter always transmit like n different streams to n different users. Okay, so n. So that's the problem we found. And on that, because of a random user selection, basically you cannot fully utilize your uh, degree of freedom. If you try to, if you push through that way, it doesn't improve your capacity. Okay. So in next uh, experiments, we actually will always use the 12 antenna, transmit antenna, but change the re number of receivers. So it's from zero to, and then now. now we can some nearly increase capacity of the of the wireless, okay. And we go to the line. They say it's a max point. If we go beyond that, it's capped again. Okay. So in overall, we say that we got this uh, six point uh, like seven times improve in, in capacity. 
But uh, it still remain the problem is remain how we could pick up all these users, right? Pick up these users is really critical to scale the network, to scale the wireless capacity. So uh, probably I'll stop here. And in the second part, I'm going to cover this part. Okay? Should we have a few questions? For yeah, sure, please. M is number yeah, of Yeah, M is the number of uh, antennas uh, at access point. Because if you have more antennas, then you need more competition to do the multiplexing. Because you have a larger demultiplexing metric, to you need more computation. OK. Yeah. So that means you can process less samples per second. Yeah. OK. Second, um, I, I, would, I would like to have a practical example. like. What I what I sense is when we increase the number of antennas, like we did the example of big AP, and then we have a large number of users. Mm -hmm. In practical terms, it boils down to having as many number of servers, like each server. It's more or less like each server for one AP or one antenna types. Mm -hmm. So, is that really a benefit of creating a huge system with this, or is it still we go on a simple type of? Okay. Uh, one on one kind of a stuff, and we can still achieve this uh, benefit. I'm, can you give a practical example of a huge system and getting benefit with the complexity involved in so much of processing? And I think the the, 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 the question is you, you, you are asking if we we why we need to build a large scale and complex system, right? Okay, compare with uh, just uh, you know currently standard specified is uh, four plus two, four plus four. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, I, I think there's a weird question to think about. Say, <coughs> you basically in this research, we just try to push something to the limit. Okay, we just see how much, how large scale we can build. Okay. Now, in practically, of course, we have a lot of other issues to consider. Uh, like, like, uh, like uh, uh, in practically, how many users say uh, typically <laughs> in a room? And uh, there's if there's any application that really requires that high throughput, right? So there's a different different perspective on that. Yeah. And from our perspective, you just try to understand how fast, how far we can go. Okay. I can give an application. I call my mom. Yeah. It's a relay since. Sorry? The last slide. Last slide. Yeah, the last slide. Uh, why was it uh, hitting a ceiling for m is equal to n? Like, uh, was it because of channel characteristics or? You mean how it capped? Yeah. Um, yes, because this you can consider about this. So, okay, because it's a kind of random pickup users. So that is a channel is kind of random. Okay. Yeah. Now we know that. No, I will go details and later, but it's only briefly touch this. So actually, the channel, we, we, the, the, when you do the decoding, actually we need to cancel the self-interference. So how is self-interference going to affect each other? It really depends on your channel. Okay. So if the channel is very correlated, so you need to spend a lot of energy to cancel this uh, interference. But that's why have different channel capacity than uh, channel structure affects your capacity. So with a random pick up uh, channel uh, coefficient, if your metric goes to notch, there's a theory on the random theory, that's more likely you've got correlated channels. Okay. Then that means you lose the capacity. <laughs> Basically, you increase the number of antenna, that doesn't give buy you more capacity because these channels are just correlated. I think it's the opposite, right? Like if the number of antennas increase, the if you do HR machine, it will, it will be kind of identity matrix, scale entity. So 
there will be lesser number of correlations, right? Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, the same the channel will be correlated. What you are saying is uh, would be true if you have independent uh, channel entries. Yeah. This so practical. Uh, yeah. So he's taking into account real effects that come from correlation. Yeah. Reciprocity, right? Yes. Uh, uh, this assumption, the, there is an assumption, right? It's only for TDD, right? Or uh, uh, even in FTD? Yeah. The FTD is uh, difficult because they <coughs> the propagation structure going to different. Yeah. Because of different frequency. But uh, I can say that FTD is more more and more system than FTD. Even LTE is going to have FTD LTE. So in Beijing, they, they only have F, F, uh, TDD LTE. Yes. <coughs> So we have break. <laughs>